you are you are welcome here to our show, Abdul. Abdul is co-founder of Strategy Tools. He also uh, worked at Cisco, having, for example, a role as Chief Strategy Officer in the United Kingdom. And so you are welcome, Abdul. Tell me, how are you feeling about this upcoming new normal? What is the the big picture you can see uh, to begin our our talk today? Tiago, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your invitation. Um, I'm always uh, always pleased to speak to you. And I, and I think I will say um, thank you for arranging to speak to me so um, at such a convenient time because I know it's, it's sort of end of your day over there and it's sort of a little bit later in the evening for me, but that's fine. Um, yes, yeah, so I think this is a question that's on everybody's mind. You know, what is the, the new normal? I think, first of all, the long-term effects of this crisis are uncertain, for sure. Um, but a couple of things are beginning to appear through the haze, through the cloud. And one of them is that our habits as consumers and as businesses have changed. And most likely they will continue to evolve in the near future. And this goes without saying. Secondly, while this has been an absolutely terrible human disaster at a, at a personal level, and, and you know, as, as every we, we do freely feel that personally, it is also at the same time a, un, a uniquely shared global common experience and shock, the likes of which and the scale of which I don't think anybody is going to experience in their lifetime ever again. Yes. So the question really is, how should we shift or evolve from this moment forward? Yeah, I was, uh, I was watching uh, an IMF report on, on the global economy. Uh, and the first sentence uh, catch me because they say, for the first time, we are living in all regions of the world, in all five continents, uh, a recession at the same time. It is by economic, but not only because, of course, in terms of behavior, as you said, is also everybody for the first time in a kind of the same page. But yes. I would like to ask you about the changes. Uh, could we separate on the changes that are from the scratch, I mean, completely new, and those changes that uh, were fastened by the, by the COVID-19, but were already being in progress, let's say. So for me, I'm not sure if you agree with me, but there are two kinds of changes. Those that came for the first time appearing, but there are also some things that were already happening and now uh, had, had speeding up. That's a good question. That's actually quite a broad question. So let me try and break it down for you. The answer may, may be quite long. Um, so I think, first of all, this was a health disaster which spilled over to create political turmoil, economic turmoil, and technological challenges. And so in each of those arenas, we see different responses and different um, challenges, as you just said, which is some were already there and some have been accelerated. What this presents then is collectively a set of strategic choices around governance, around transformation, internationalization, and the various economic frameworks that we had, and the assumption, of course, that goes with all of those that we had. Now, let me sort of bottom line it here before we go any further, because I really want to make sure people get some of my conclusions very early on. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the details later on. I think, so the first of all, a couple of things or a few things that, that are emerging, a few key insights from the work that we're doing at Strategy Tools is around firm capabilities. And so there is a distinct move away from what I would call traditional strategy planning to scenario development. Secondly, 
there has been an increase now, even though it was sort of happening already, but even now increased increasing in data driven analytical insights. And largely, I, I, I suspect that is largely down to the fact that many of the historical assumptions can no longer be relied on because much of the data that we had historically doesn't really have the predictive power that it had historically. For CEOs and leadership teams, there is now a clear recognition that they need to develop a transformation mindset as a core capability. And the last thing I would add is there is now a, also a realization that the efficiency only model that we were, we were using to operate many of our firms, many of our ecosystems has to move to a, a model of resilience with efficiency. And so building, nurturing and participating in these ecosystems that are at the same time the most efficient for you, but also the most resilient in face of future crisis. So those would be the broad uh, points that I would, I would sort of uh, underline at, at the beginning, um, just to sort of get those out there. So the question then becomes, what's the response then? So uh, how, how have people responded to this? And I think, you know, we've seen, first of all, let's start with governments, you know, they've responded on a, on a vast scale for many of them. As you remember, Pre-COVID, many of our countries or many of our regions around the world, certainly in Europe and certainly here in the UK, we were under an austerity regime. We were, you know, cost-cutting. We were trying to reduce deficits. And yet what, what we've seen now as, as part of the pandemic response mm. is a complete sort of um, brushing away of all of those decisions. And we've gone into an environment where as they seek to protect the economic activity, spending has increased. Now, we're spending forward, of course, um, which means this will have to be paid for eventually. But for now, the immediate funding crisis, which is what it was considered way back in April, and April, March, I think the realization has now come that this now needs to be a long term stimulus package. And so this acceleration now of, of, of what used to be austerity to spending has created an environment of where we're seeing accelerated digitization, accelerated technology adoption resulting from the national lockdowns that were implemented, which was surprising because this wasn't one of the side effects that we were expecting to see, or not at least certainly not amongst the people that we were speaking to. And in many cases, what's happened around the world is, is this digitization drive has actually almost skipped a generation or two because some of the reluctance that was built into organizations to not spend, to not move forward, to not change has happened. And so I think those things put together, that, that, that need for change with additional money that has come into the economy that wasn't there before, has accelerated many, many efforts that were possibly already on the shelf to be accelerated. They were in the pipeline. We just saw a need to do it more quickly. And this has consequences, obviously, on not only workers, but also on their digital skills. What do they need to work in this new environment? Um, also around country infrastructure. Who builds it? Who pays for it? How much of it do we share? How much of it do we not share? This then results in a change in landscape for the businesses in, in what they operate. And, and done well, of course, this can be a hugely beneficial process. Done badly, and this is the other scenario, it can become a very closed, protective scenario as well. Yeah. And, well, and the reality is probably somewhere in between. Yeah. Well, by the way, uh, deficit reduction was also the main goal of our country, for example, mm. pre-COVID, uh, as well as in Europe, many countries. But uh, as you said, even, even government and policies have to be changed. 
and this shift, for example, in central banks' role uh, appears as maybe uh, a different scenario for for the whole presence of uh, central banks and governments in the economy. But the question is, during this COVID crisis, during the health emergency that we have, we shall, of course, uh, think first of all in human, uh, in human life, but isn't it also something that can foster changes ahead? I mean, this uh, different role not only of central banks, but the need for bailouts and maybe, for example, some changes in labor uh, regulations. And, and here in Brazil, it is something very, very uh, complicated, okay? As well as I know in, in, in Germany, for example, too. Uh, can it be also a, a, an important driver for for future changes. I mean, the pandemia uh, arrived uh, as a, a challenge, not only for business leaders, of course, but as well for leaders in any environment and any institution. So this is another uh, way of saying things that we are everybody now in the same page, not only because everybody is feeling maybe afraid of, uh, of the virus, but uh, in, in tackling issues uh, in a completely different way. So we, used, we were used to speak about the VUCA world. Mm. And Chris, for example, someday speaking with us, you were together, uh, told that it's a mega VUCA world now. But maybe it, it is even more uh, complicated and complex using the word complex as it is, uh, intrinced, uh, entrenched and, and, and net, everything net together. So uh, I, I, would, I would like to ask you, since you had as chief strategy officer at Cisco, for example, are, are, are people, uh, leaders prepared, not only for uh, coping with uncertainty, but with a, uh, a whole different configuration in terms of geopolitics, in terms of globalization, in terms of regulations, in terms of it's not just using more technology, not just going to a digital world, but it affects our psychology in a way. So I would drive a question. How, how, are, how prepared are uh, we as as person and and the business uh, leaders that you know and face it's of course a, a general question too mm. but in order to keep our conversation how 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 can we figure out this thing uh, okay so that's an interesting question and multifaceted um, i i think if you sort of if i sort of track back from what you said at, at the end there and then go back through the questions that you asked so i think First of all, most companies and most organizations um, try to create as much stability as possible for just to be able to operate. I think having constant turbulence, constant volatility uh, is, is an environment that just cannot be managed. And so a large part of you know, the leadership role a large part of the, uh, of the role of the frameworks that you put around the organization is to actually shield the organization from a lot of that turbulence. So you can actually operate and do what you need to do um, and get product out the door and sell and so on. Now, of course, I think what the pandemic has very clearly demonstrated is that these shifts are happening more and more frequently and closer together. That's the only difference. So it's not that shifts never happened or turbulence was not happening or volatility wasn't there. It was just that it was a time factor. They were more widely spread out. And so now I think the realization is, is if these points of disruption, disturbance in the business environment are going to be happening more regularly, 
then we need to create different capabilities and develop different capabilities within the business. And so this is probably where I, where I would, and I haven't, I've done no studies on this or read any research, but I would just say from just intuitively, this is where individuals that are used to operating in a predictable, slow environment will not thrive in this new environment. And so th this is, I think, the human change that needs to happen. Secondly, I think the interconnectedness of world economies, of environments, of our banking system, the financial system, um, has been very acutely um, made obvious to us. That there was a time when a local economy having a recession, it was a localized situation. And governments, the banking systems, the money markets could rely on other buoyant economies in which to either invest or to go seek additional funding in order to help the local economy. So I think one of the key, um, one of the main challenges this time is number one, the interconnectedness that we've created now was part of the reason we're feeling this so, so um, acutely everywhere. But on the flip side, it's also one of the reasons we were able to respond so well. You know, we've had pretty much two decades now of installing and building significant amounts of communications infrastructure across the globe, much of which was left dark and switched off because we never had the, 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 the demand to use that infrastructure. And so once the, 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 the crisis hit, and we found, you know, huge populations having to work from home, not traveling, um, a schedule where power usage was following, you know, a, a whole different profile. The usage of broadband was following a whole different profile. The reason we were able to even do that was because the technological investments infrastructure had already been done. And one of the outcomes of that process, of course, was a realization by many users that, you know, it is less about the amount of bandwidth that I have and more about the reliability of the connection. And so that was a very interesting insight for me from the work that I did, which was that switching of focus to, I'd rather have less bandwidth, but it be more reliable than can I just have the fastest download possible, which actually just does change for many of, of our telcos, how they should construct some of their offers moving forward. And we'll get onto that later on when we talk about this. But going back to the other point, so I think one of the, one of the key, one of the other bits of metrics that came out of this process was we found that in a recent study with McKinsey, for example, that 20% of organizations are already, that's one fifth of the organizations they interviewed are preparing for this new type of working condition until the end of 2021 and beyond. So this remote working, um, video, voice video data, um, high bandwidth on the edge of the network, um, offices probably not being filled. Uh, this is going to be the normal for at least the next year, year and a half. And what they've also said in, in, in the same survey was almost 79% of the organizations agree that the social distancing requirements will be the biggest barrier to people returning to work. And this is where I think the technology just cannot address some of the social problems, no matter how much you, you try and fix it. I mean, these things are, are real human problems that, that you just cannot address with technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You pointed out this paradox because somehow technology enabled some many benefits that we have now. And also this interconnected world that fascinated some struggling issues was, were also enabled by the technology. It brings us again to the acronym VUCA. This is the mm -hmm. ambiguity. Yes. Uh, things are not as simple as it used to be. Well, you know, what, what I would point out there is, is look at the way, you know, news reports would have happened, you know, in, in the 1970s or 80s. 
right? Mm. You know, the the news report would have itself been delayed, um, maybe by days, maybe by weeks, depending on where the report was, and when it got back to you know our news stations. Okay, we had a situation where we had real time logging of incidents as they happened around the world on a website for everybody to see social media went crazy we had you know good news and bad news and fake news and this is what the you know the the flip side of the interconnectedness gave us on the one hand it was the very thing we needed to address the problem but what we don't know is how much it actually exacerbated the problem and and i, I don't think we'll ever know so everything, I mean, almost any tool, let me put it that way, any tool, um, it depends on the user. And if you want to use it for solving the problem, you can do. If you want to use it for creating a worse problem, you can do that as well. And, and this is what happened. And so I think, you know, technology is, is neutral. You know, uh, a lot of these things are neutral in and of themselves. They, they have no energy to do anything. Uh, but I think it's in the hands of, of governments, of decision makers, of leaders, of organizations that they really come to, to create uh, utility and usefulness. And what I would add there is I think, you know, out of that process, what comes is, you know, really sort of the sort of top, I would say, the sort of three things that I can see the technology really, really sort of contributing to on a positive side. The first one is, I think, it is clear that much larger share of our work will have to be done virtually and remotely moving forward. I think that is some of the things that, to your question earlier, this will stay. The second one, I think, is businesses, in order to cope with this, will have to adopt more automation, more artificial intelligence, and more digitization in various respects. Now, even for organizations that were not thinking of doing it, that will be the only way they will survive and thrive. And secondly, I think customers that we serve, whether, whether they're business customers or consumers, we will have to engage with them more digitally by definition now moving forward and i th and and those these three things are here to stay they will they will not go away on the flip side what we have is the question of how much and how quickly and this has the i think the the propensity to create a gap amongst businesses amongst nations and amongst regions of speed and adoption. So the ones that have the speed to be able to adopt this quickly may see themselves being ahead of the pack. Now this has consequences obviously for potential global power shifts, rearrangement of financial markets, potential rearrangement of supply chains, and so on, and you, know, and you can work through the consequences. So I think that remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. And again, speaking about capability building, uh, I, I listen to more, many people uh, talking about uh, reskilling employees on digital capabilities, but what worries me much more is dealing with this paradox, this ambiguity, because uh, on regard of leadership, and that's something that I, I used to work a lot of with, with leadership development programs. So I'm always uh, thinking about how to, to train and develop and help uh, leaders to, well, to handle these issues, to tackle with this even more ambiguity that we have. For example, today I was speaking with a, a, a CSO here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. He's doing business with Africa. So he told me, Chag, look, uh, organizations now are looking for more resilience, just as you said, Abdul, looking for resilience. So a way to mitigate or uh, dilute risk is, for example, investing in a region with 50 countries that 
uh, has 50 uh, different threats and opportunities, but this brings us to the dilution of risk. Instead of investing only in, for example, China, uh, which is a one government, one partisan, one uh, environment, and so on. So this uh, challenge that strategists uh, have now to uh, looking for the, uh, more resilience and more resilient organizations, uh, it, 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 it appears to me as maybe quite difficult let's say, a reskilling project, not on technical skills, moving employees to a digital environment, but uh, driving our leaders to cope with this even more uh, uh, ambiguity. It, but, it's uh, in, it's, yes, yes. So it's interesting you say that because I think what I would add there is the risk mitigation is only as good as the policies and the government governance that we have in place. Um, and again, the, this ultimately goes down to what kind of trade agreements, for example, do we have in place? Uh, what kind of tariffs are there? Whether what the import export restrictions are, uh, and these are bigger questions than, than, than more than an individual firm can address. But I think this is where I would say our, you know, political leaders have to step up and realize that, you know, the resources, and this is going to be interesting, how many, how much of their resources will they share and how much will they keep for themselves? Because I think, you know, you can have this utopian idea of everybody continues doing business the, the way we used to do business, right? Well, if supply chains are being impacted, if global uh, raw materials are impacted, and availability is reduced, then the natural reaction is, is protectionism. I mean, it, it, you know, I suspect, you know, one of the scenarios is protectionism, unless there are agreements in place to prevent that. So, I, I mean, it, and again, as I say, we don't know. I mean, it depends. But what I can speak to is knowledge transfer, because I think this whole idea of, of um, skilling leaders is really about awareness. And, and, as you, and I think, you know, we've learned a lot from this pandemic, actually. You know, whether it's as individuals, as organizations, or as communities, what we need to do, though, is, is remain grounded as we come out of the pandemic, and, and we will come out of it at some point, and we don't lose that learning that we've had from it, and we use it to drive the right kinds of change. Um, otherwise, of course, the danger is, and, and, and we, we've seen this in, in, in small pockets, where as soon as relaxation was introduced, people went back to behaving the way they used to behave. You know, so even though you know, we had a case over the last weekend in the UK where we had some really nice weather and beaches were crowded, even though nobody had said a vaccination had been found or a cure had been found. And so consequently, there was another, you know, the, 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 um, the rates have increased again. So people have a tendency to go back to doing what they were doing. It is a natural response. And so I think we need to learn from what we have. Now, one of the things we get out of this process is that, as we said earlier, it has accelerated many things that were already underway. But what, and what it has done is it's compressed a lot of the innovation that would have happened probably over the next two or three years into this year which means it's brought a lot of investment forward, a lot of ideas forward. Now, this has been particularly, I think, interesting for our um, education institutions because they're actually at the source of a lot of this learning that we want to create for the new leadership. I mean, again, if we don't create the new generation in the right way, then they won't you know, land in our organizations appropriately skilled. And so... You know, and, and we ourselves as strategy tools had to follow a similar curve, which was the universities and educational establishments across the globe have realized that online education has to now be, now be part of the new normal. Corporations are now realizing that online education has to be part of their key learning management systems. You know, we here at strategy tools, I think as 
this realization took off exponentially in, in the last sort of few weeks, almost 80 to 90% of our offerings now are online. And in fact, for, for many of the work that we do, or much of the training that we do, is 100% online. Yeah, let me add, let me add some, uh, something. Uh, if we speak about blended, uh, I mean, both digital and face-to-face, -face, not only education, but uh, I think that afterwards, I don't know when, but afterwards, <laughs> the, the, the pandemic, I think we are going to have uh, much more blended things than only digital or only face-to-face. -face. But I would like to ask you, how, how to imagine, and how to develop, and how to design optimized blended programs? For example, uh, I, I think that uh, in the education field, we, we will... Uh, realize that the best of the worlds will be not only digital and not only face-to-face, -face, but blended. But that's something also that we don't know how to do because we are learning to go digital. We are learning to do, for example, uh, master degrees uh, online. Okay. But uh, when we can... Uh, take the opportunity to use all, all of this in a blended way. I mean, to, to take the best from the face-to-face -face and the best from the digital. How to optimize it? So maybe uh, blended strategies shall be an interesting challenge, isn't it? It's, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, what's interesting about it is to understand that it doesn't happen overnight. So let me give you let me give you a little, little scenario here in the UK. So as the pandemic hit here in the UK almost 15 million students had their education disrupted. Like 15 15 and a half million UK students were disrupted. Now this this was really a watershed moment not only for the UK but every education establishment across the world. And and of course historically, you know, Online education has been on the, on the periphery of, of, of almost every university, every school. You know, you know, we have it, but, you know, let's not focus on it. And, and, and it's there as an option. So blended, as you say, has always been on the agenda, just not very high on the agenda. It's just been there as, a, as an option. But, of course, the preferred model was in class. And the preferred model for many universities, certainly here in the UK over the last few years, has been uh, the foreign student community, because that's obviously a significant uh, revenue for them. Now, interestingly, though, over the last six to seven years, a number of universities have been investing in online. And if you remember a few years back, there was a, a big um, a potential transition to the massively online education sort of model the MOOCs models yeah. and so the universities that had invested in, in addressing that disruption as soon as the pandemic hit they were able to transition to an online model and we saw this with many of the universities where almost you know within a few days they were offering some type of Zoom-based course, of, you know, some, sorry, not Zoom, uh, one of the online um, um, software was being used, Zoom, WebEx, uh, whatever. Um, and then very shortly after that, they began converting their courses to online modules. So I think this goes back to what we said earlier. It was on the agenda. People had been thinking about it, but they just didn't realize that they needed to action it now because they felt they could put it off. Um, just imagine the scenario, though. If this had happened only 10 years earlier, we would have been crippled. I mean, the education system would have been crippled in a way that would have been unimaginable. Um, just the simple fact that we have access to broadband and it's reasonably widely available, it's, it's fairly reliable across the world, and most people have access to some kind of smartphone made this move so much easier.
So I think, you know, as, as we said earlier, I think a lot of things came together where if it had only been 10 years earlier, it would have been a different, different story. And so this, the, the decision for many of the universities, though, was very much a, the strategy was around, do we buy, do we build, or do we buy and build, or do we partner? And so this build by partner strategy uh, for many of the universities was already there. They just had to execute on it. And for many of them, they went to a buy build, which is we'd all, we've already built a lot of our courses to go online. Okay, let's buy in the tools that we need because we can assume that the technology and infrastructure is there and we'll move forward. The, the interesting thing linked to this as well is, of course, in the corporate environment, they have to do a similar transition. Now, many corporates had already implemented some type of remote working environment, which wasn't designed for education, by the way, because it was designed for the occasional time when an employee is not at the office. That environment, many corporations were reluctant to allow employees to work permanently from home. Why? Because there's a historical mindset here. You know, we've invested this, you know, significant amount of, of, of investment in this office space. We've built this campus, you know, canteens. We have HR that has built, you know, a work culture around a particular sort of, sort of model. Um, how can we possibly let go of this? And so the reluctance was, well, if we let all of the employees work from home, then what are we going to do with all this investment? Well, what this pandemic has demonstrated and and even for the firms that i was working with employees in sales functions who typically would be on the road have in a significant measure not reported any loss of productivity across many of the organization that, that i've been talking to and that in and of itself was fascinating because, and, and, and the consequence of this is that many, many individuals now in, in, in many sort of walks of life and, and employment have seen how the morning commute and the evening commute, by not having to do those, their quality of life has increased. And yet they're still able to do what they need to do for those that can work remotely. And, and again, I, I recognize fully, this is not an option open to everybody in, in, you know, in the whole world, but for the community that is able to do this, they have seen significant benefits. And so one of the, one of the interesting consequences of this, of course, is that many companies now are stepping back and really asking very you know, pointed questions around, do we need this office space? Does it need to be as big as it is? And in some recent, um, I remember met, uh, metrics um, from some research that McKinsey did, I think over half of the companies they interviewed have said they're going to pull back from the real estate they already have. And many of the landlords are stepping forward and now offering sweeteners. You know, you know, you know we'll give you better deals. Well, it may just be too little and too late now because the technology has proven itself. And so I think... Depending on whether you talk about learning for executives, learning at university, whether it's remote working, what it really boils down to is some of our assumptions about how an organization works, what exactly is organizational culture, and what exactly is productivity, those are now being questioned. And, and th this is why I think it's, it will be a, a very different world that emerges after this because we've actually experienced what it's like to not have some of those things. The downside, as we know, and this has been you know, well documented now, is that we are social, social creatures. You know, we like to be with people. So being you know, permanently working from home, uh, we've seen the, the, the flip side of, of, of you know, the, the mental effects, the psychological effects it can have. So maybe what we need is, is solutions to that problem. You know, we need yeah. to build communities and closeness in some other yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. In spite of liking to to be at home and uh, not having to to deal with the traffic here in São Paulo, for example, yes. uh, sometimes uh, having to to pass 
through uh, uh, one hour, two hours uh, in, 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 into the traffic. But uh, I miss airplanes. I miss uh, of course. travels. I, I miss people. And uh, for sure, I'm not the only one. As you said, we are social creatures. So I think this is something also interesting. Actually, let me stop you there. Because uh, let me stop you there because I, I just come to mind, and I'll mention it now before I forget it. One of the other surprising uh, results from some of the the research that I was looking at is that the power dynamics in the office environment has been impacted by this process. Okay, this I found this to be fascinating research, and and it's been a huge equalizer. Right. So in the past, you know, imagine that people would fly to business meetings, you know, you've got your power suit on and 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 you're all in the room and the person who's on the phone or who's dialing in remotely is now at a significant advantage. Right. A disadvantage. Sorry. And, and he's seen as the, you know, maybe not part of the team, maybe not even in the room in many cases. Well, when online attendance is the only option and nobody can travel everybody's at the same level yeah. which means nobody has the the the, the, the corner office <laughs> well, ex well exactly but, but also nobody nobody's got the power suit on <laughs> nobody's got the you know the in room in room you know sort of uh, persona and so all of a sudden i think what it really really sort of brings to the fore is which jobs can we actually do run virtually and for what do we actually need to be in the physical office for? Because many executives that I've spoken to have actually said, you know, the fact that I can have remote calls with New York, Sao Paulo, and Munich, all within three hours of each other, where everybody is, is remote, actually makes for much more productive meetings. Because you're not spending, yeah. you know, six hours traveling somewhere, then, you know, you know and everything else that goes with that. And... And that is quite fascinating, I think. I, I, I found that quite interesting. And I think the other thing that we need to really look at here is, is linked to this, is what, what is the pace of decision-making that we need moving forward? Because often what I find is the traditional models delayed negotiations delayed decision making because everybody had to be in the same room they had to be you know blah and so on and so forth well in the world that we're moving to that time could make the difference between winning or losing so in fact i think this this is this is where where i see some of the basic fundamental dynamics of how we've operated at the executive level and what it means to be at the executive level you know why are you there what is your role? Those things will be questioned. This is really interesting. Uh, social and power dynamics and decision-making processes uh, already already changed, but we've got to, to think about the near future and how we're going to deal with yes. these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, we are getting close to the, to the end of this interview, Abdul. For sure, we've got to to schedule other, other other conversations to 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 get all your experience and and, and all your insights uh, let me let me try to to ask uh, what I think would be an interesting uh, question if you were still uh, an executive as you were the chief strategy officer in the telco uh, industry or even in other technology software sectors uh, what do you think you would be worried about today considering not the post covid strategy that we are used to speak about one two months ago but the in covid strategy that most executives are now speaking about i mean uh, the duration uh, of the pandemic and the new normal and everything uh, put a new concept uh, on the table uh, in COVID strategy. So what would you do to prepare uh, or to redesign the strategies uh, for the organizations, not after, the COVID, but during this, this process that we still don't know how long 
is going to be. Good question. How to, so how to make decisions? Yes. Uh, when you know that these decisions are not going to be for good, but must be done now. Okay. So let me focus on the telcos because I spent a long time working working with these organizations, and and I think the first thing that must be realized is that in the pandemic scenario itself, one of the one of the realizations that has come about is that telcos and communication service providers have been recognized as engines of resilience and innovation for societies. The very fact that we could have this conversation, that we could do the work and was because of these institutions, was because of these organizations. In a matter of days, you know, after the lockdown started, these providers stepped up to the challenge and entire populations were able to just continue working. So for the most part, telcos, you know, whether they're mobile or fixed network operators, have been able to accept the strain, as I said earlier, because they, they, we made investments earlier on. And they recognize that these dumb pipes, you know, the, these wires that were just connecting things together, are actually, from a government perspective now, key national infrastructure. And so they are key not only to the national infrastructure, but also to having a functioning economy. So I think the role of the telco now has been redefined within, within this scenario right now. You know, they've come to a level of prominence that, that was probably waning, you know, because there was this big talk about, well, these new generation providers, you know, like the, you know, the Amazons, the, the Google, the Facebooks, they're now going to be the new, new providers and these old telcos that are providing these dump pipes uh, are probably not so important. Well, actually, what we've proven now is that they're not. So, and secondly, the operators in the pandemic, what did they do? They responded very quickly to offer consumers relief on adjusted pricing, on, on removing data caps. You know, they zero rated some of their services, and especially to um, our colleagues in the health industry. You know, and, and they offered for many of them, you know, waivers and holidays. So these were immediate actions they took, um, which because they've taken them, people may expect it to continue after the, the, the pandemic as well. And so there's some decisions there which have been taken immediately that have helped that may need to continue moving forward. So these proactive moves have, I think, helped to, to for many of them, redefine their role. Uh, for example, in the UK, right, 40%, I think, of the UK consumers agreed that the service they received from their telco was acceptable or higher. And the reliability was more important than connection speed, something we've spoken about earlier as well. And this same statistic also was, was true for the US. Flexibility of packages, you've been able to do it now, offer it to me later as well. So, you know, th this idea of, you know, packages are fixed, they can't be moved. Well, you've demonstrated they can be. So I think that's going to be quite interesting. From a, um, from a technology adoption perspective, because that's really what the key, key um, um, innovation driver has been over the last decade or so, 3G and 4G have been the foundation of almost all the innovation that we've had over the last decade or two now. You know, and, and just, um, you know, let me just give that a quick recap. So 2G was when we got SMS and texting, okay? And that gave us basically things like um, um, mobile communications. M-Pesa in Kenya, for example, was, a, was an application that came out during the 2G arena. And what they did, what they, I mean, M-Pesa now is almost processing 50% of the Kenyan GDP. And that was based on 2G technology. 3G gave us the mobile web. And 4G gave us the social network environment that we have, the social sharing and video. 5G will give us the immersive environment that we need for this, this world of remote working, of remote learning, of remote um, 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 collaboration. So 5G is, get, is, is for the telcos now where most of their focus has to be. In, 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 in my opinion. And, and we know right now from metrics, the research that we've done, 70% of the global population is connected to a mobile network. Okay, and, and that's pretty good. 50% of the global population has access to a 4G network. 
okay now these these g's that i keep talking about they are the generations in in the technology uh, sort of sort of um um evolution now on average in our industry these generations take around 10 years to come to maturity and the interesting thing with 5g is 5g is actually a business focused enterprise focused technology 4g was very much about the consumer 5g is about the business and so most likely knowing how businesses work 5g will probably have a much longer lifetime than the, this this 10 years that we've had with the older technologies and so telcos have to appreciate this so this shift that they will have to create will mean that that 5g and we've seen this already will radically start to transform industry verticals in a way that's been the, the same way that 4g transformed the consumer ecosystem i mean that's the level of change we can expect to see in industry verticals and what we've also seen during this same time period is governments across the world as they've been responding to the to to the crisis is they've eased the restrictions on 5g adoption on 5g rollout yeah. um you know the the possibility of entering into a global recession the likes of which we've never seen before has meant operators for example in china japan south korea in the us for example for instance accelerating 5g adoption offering tax cuts subsidies increased investment uh, new zealand for example cancelled an auction that they were going to do a spectrum auction and instead they they offered it to the telcos on a flat fixed price you know really cheap uh, thailand for example right now is leading the asean region in 5g rollout in EMEA, you know, we know many of the regulators have accelerated the release of Spectrum. You know, 5G wasn't supposed to be auctioned yet. They brought that forward. Um, some regulators have responded the opposite, though, which is quite interesting. So France, uh, Spain, Austria, Portugal have actually postponed some of their auctions. So 5G for me is today's solution. Telcos have to focus on. It is the enabler that will drive the economy in the post pandemic scenario as well and it's going to be the catalyst for not only national recovery but also the resilience and the readiness that we need to face any future emergencies that may come about and because 5G is really going to impact the verticals this is where the transformational capability is needed to be able to re-engineer business models and enable new ways of social and commercial interaction so of course it's going to impact uh, not only the telco industry itself but it is going to promote opportunities and threats for every other industries and maybe this is uh, something interesting also to to research on uh, how how do i as an entrepreneur as a strategist uh, as, as, a, as an executive how can I take opportunity of this, yes. this next wave? Uh, uh, and I think the opportunities, I mean, if you just look at the, how innovation accelerated with under 4G and 3G, you know, what, what it, it gave us, you know, it gave us Facebook, it gave us Google, right? We have that level of disruption now happening within the verticals. So I think the opportunities now really have to be, First of all, new roles, new types of jobs that don't exist today. This is absolutely for sure where the future is. So entrepreneurs have to understand that they're looking at things that don't exist yet, roles that don't exist, processes that don't exist, or maybe capabilities that don't exist that will have to be created. You know, we have to go, we as strategists need to look at and, and essentially address, well, what does a value chain actually involve now? What does the extended value chain look like? Um, how, well, how does a business model evolve and develop in this kind of scenario now? And, and what I would uh, summarize with is, is what, the, what the pandemic has proven beyond anything is that not only are we resilient as humanity, but I think we really um, need to harness technology in a way that allows us to move forward. Because I think without it, another crisis like this Uh, could wipe out the first 50 years of this century. 
You know, we, we had the 2008 crisis, we had this crisis, which means this decade pretty much has been written out. If we have a, a couple more of these in the next year or two or, or decade or so, then I think, you know, it, it doesn't bear thinking about. And I think that resilience is technology enabled, but managed by us. Uh, Abdul, you, you have never come to Brazil, did you? I haven't. I would look. Are you inviting me? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, then, then, then I'll be. As soon as the planes start flying, I will be there. As soon as we have it again. Yes. But you, you know quite well uh, America. You, you lived in the USA, didn't you? I've worked in the US, yes. I worked in Silicon Valley, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So I, I, might I ask you a final message? Uh, if not uh, specifically for Brazilian business leaders, but what would you recommend specifically to, to the Americas or, or, or maybe to, to Latin America? Since we've got many countries here in, uh, we call development countries, uh, what, what, what would you tell us about uh, what to look for and where to pay most attention? Uh, maybe besides all of the advisors that you have given us upon the technology and telco, but what would you tell us if you were invited to come to Brazil now and speak to business leaders? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I can say any more than I already have, but I think what I would add is, is really just repeat what I said earlier. I think this is an environment where we need to individually, but also organizationally look at our capabilities. Whereas whether it's the firm level capabilities or personal capabilities. And I think I opened this, the, the session up by sort of bottom lining a few points and I'll repeat those again. I think we have to move into an environment where we are not just strategic planning, but scenario development and scenario development as a, as a key capability that we do on a regular basis. Now your time horizons have to be um, sufficient for your industry or for your uh, arena that you're in. So for some, that could be six months. For some, it could be six years. For others, it could be 60 years. But well, whatever it is, build those scenarios, work to them. Data-driven analytical insights has to be key, which means hire data scientists. You know, hire professionals that have been trained to create strategic foresight from data and use it. As leadership teams and teams within the organization, we have to develop a transformational mindset to constantly transform. And I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, we live in a VUCA world. It is volatile, it's uncertain, but we're also living, living with basically an environment that has ongoing turbulence. So volatility is there, but it's turbulent in a way that the shocks are bigger and that they're happening more, more frequently. And, and that, that will become normality moving forward. And I think this idea, as I said earlier, which is, you know, most of our training, especially in business schools, is focused around predictive analytics and an efficiency-based mindset. This is what it's about. You know, all of our training that we get around quality systems, around designing value chains, around designing business models is all about squeezing cost out of the process. You squeeze the cost out, you squeeze it out until you get something that is so finely tuned that it costs you as, I mean, that's your competitive advantage once you've done that. And then you try and keep it that way. Uh, and what, we find, what we're finding is that introduces a level of weakness in the face of this kind of turbulence, in the face of this kind of volatility, because you're not then able to uh, more, um, move or change as quickly as you as you would like and so this is where i think moving to a mindset of resilience with efficiency uh, needs to now be the way that you build the way that you nurture and the way that you create your ecosystem the way that you or the ecosystem that you work in and the value chains that you operate great well thank you it's been my pleasure tiago thank you for this conversation um i've had a, i've had a really really good time thank you very much Well, thank you for your time. Let's keep in touch. And uh, we look forward to see each other again in Brazil or in England. Absolutely right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, my friend.